Okay, if we can turn, please, in our Bibles to the book of Judges, and we're going to be reading from chapter 4, verse 10, and we will read down to verse uh, the end of the chapter, actually, uh, from verse 10 to the end of the chapter. And we're going to give a title here, and it's going to be called Nailing Worldly Wisdom. Nailing Worldly Wisdom. And I guess you'll see the reason why as we proceed. But verse 10 says this, and, and Barak called Zebulun, and Naphtali uh, to Kedesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heba the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites and pitched his tent onto the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kedesh. And they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harosheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. And Deborah said unto Barak, Up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his host with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host unto Harasheth of the Gentiles, and all the host of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword, and there was not a man left. Howbeit Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heba the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heba the Kenite. And Jael went out to meet Sisera and said unto him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, fear not, and when he had turned in unto her into the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. Again, he said unto her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be when any man doth come and inquire of thee and say, Is there any man here that thou shalt say no? Then Jael, Heba's wife, took a nail of the tent and took an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail into his temples and fastened it unto the ground, for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said unto him, Come, and I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, Behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, and they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. And again, God will indeed bless that reading of his precious word to us uh, this morning. So as we consider this portion, uh, we notice, uh, just reminding ourselves of last week, uh, that Barak needed encouragement. Uh, the Lord had showed him that he was to uh, take on this mighty foe, but he was reluctant to go. And he said, basically, I won't go unless uh, Deborah uh, would go with him. So Deborah agrees. And so uh, he calls uh, his uh, <coughs> kinfolk uh, to battle. Uh, Zebulun, Naphtali, the two tribes that are mentioned here, uh, to Kadesh, and he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. And then in verse 11, we have a, a kind of very interesting little statement that, that almost seems irrelevant, but it's setting the scene. And you'll see this a lot in Judges. There'll be a little statement, and it's preparing the way for something to come. So it seems uh, at first just glance a little bit uh, irrelevant, but we're going to see it's very relevant indeed. 
So this man Heber the Kenite, uh, and of course uh, the word Heber, it's very similar to the word Hebron, which means fellowship, and, and Heber means company, companionship in fellowship. And it's kind of interesting that a man whose name's fellowship actually seems to have separated himself from his brethren, uh, because it tells us in verse 11, now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father-in-law of Moses, had severed himself from the Kenites. So a man whose name has the idea of companionship and, and fellowship, but he broke fellowship with uh, his, his own people, and he left the area where they were and went north and pitched his tent in the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kedesh. Now, I want you just to notice something, because we, we saw in chapter 1 of Judges in verse 16, a reference to the Kenites. It says, the children of the Kenite, Moses' father-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees, so that's Jericho, with the children of Judah, into the wilderness of Judah, which lieth in the south of Arad, and they went and dwelt among the people. So, obviously, this man... Heber the Kenite eventually got tired of his own people and he left there in the south in the desert, you know, the Judean desert in the south. And he goes all the way up north into what we would consider to be Galilee area and he pitches his tent there. And again, human wisdom would say, What's the big deal about all this? Why, why even mention it? Uh, but um, even though it seems a fact of little importance, we're going to see that in the providence of God, it's, it's God moving him there so that his wife could be there to fulfill the prophecy that a woman would get the glory. If you remember uh, that the honor was not going to go to Barak, it was going to go to a woman instead. And so God has got to move the woman that he's going to use close to the battlefield. And so he, he basically... She goes where her husband goes, nomadic people anyway. And so her moving up there, moving north, was part of God's plan and purposes. And of course, he, Heber the Kenite, might have felt that he was in control in his location, uh, maybe in falling out with his people and say, well, I'm, I'm off, I'm leaving. But ultimately, it was God in his providence, working out all the details. And, and again, we just see this. We see, we see it so often in the word of God, don't we? What we call the doctrine of the providence of God. You see it most clearly in the life of Joseph, you know, his brethren selling him into Egypt, the, the incident with Potiphar's wife, the, all, every little detail, uh, even though people made those decisions, and yet... Uh, Clearly, you see God's providential overruling for good to fulfill and accomplish his purposes. And we get that same picture here, uh, that although he thinks he's in control in his re relocation, but the Lord really was the one who was behind his movements with a purpose to deliver his people. And we can do that, too. I think as we get older, we get more reflective about life and we look back over our lives and and again you can just see in your own life evidence of the providence of god that you made this decision you made that decision and you think you're in control of it all but you can see how the lord had his purposes in every little twist and turn and isn't it wonderful by the way to to ha have our lives in subjection to the overruling sovereignty and purposes of God. I just find it such a comfort to know that he's able to work out all these things in a marvelous way for his purpose and glory. And so verse 12 says, and they showed Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. So it, even not only, uh, you know, it's interesting that um, Ho Hobab, uh, who he is descended from, was Moses' father-in-law, and so they generally were friendly towards the children of Israel. Uh, they had a good relationship with them. But this man, Heber, not only falls out with his brethren and moves and leaves them, but he also doesn't have that same affinity to the children of Israel. In fact, he seems to be more comfortable 
making alliances with with the Canaanites and with this man Sisera. In fact, uh, he even tips them off that the, there's a movement in the Israeli ranks, and he tells them that Sisera. Uh, tell Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. And, and so certainly uh, this man Heber is certainly not a, a loyal uh, either to his family roots or loyal to uh, his historic alliances with the children of Israel. And yet again, God is going to use this uh, for his purposes. And so verse 13, it says, And Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even 900 chariots of iron, and all the people that were with him from Harasheth of the Gentiles unto the river of Kishon. And so there's kind of a, a standoff. There's, there's 900 chariots of iron down in the valley. And then there's uh, Barak and his 10,000 men on Mount Tabor. Chariots are use, useless on Mount Tabor. So while ever Barak stays up on the mountain, he's safe. But while ever he stays there, the, his people are under the dominion of the cruel enemy, Jabin, uh, the king, and also Sisera, the captain of his horse. And so we've got this kind of standoff situation. It's only when he leaves his comfort zone on the mountain that ever will there be any hope of the enemy de being defeated. So this is the, the scenario we find. 900 chariots down in the valley, uh, on the, in, the, in the river valley, the valley of the river Kishon. Of course, we've said already that it's, uh, it's the dry season and it's nothing, it's just like a little stream. So the land is dry, it's perfect for chariots, everything's in the favor of uh, Sisera. So notice verse 14, Deborah said unto Barak, up, for this is the day in which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into thine hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. So Deborah encourages Barak to go into the battle. And how does she encourage him to go into the battle? By telling him, the Lord has already gone ahead of him. The Lord has delivered Caesar into thy hand. Is not the Lord gone out before thee? In other words, the Lord has gone before. He's prepared the way. He's gone uh, before. You have confidence to go into the battle because the picture is that the Lord as king is already marching at the head of his army. And you see a similar uh, thoughts to this in other scriptures. Let me just give you a, a couple of examples, some we're familiar with from 1 Samuel, in 1 Samuel chapter 8, 1 Samuel chapter 8 and verse 20. You get this idea, the Lord going before his people into battle. Uh, 1 Samuel 8 verse 20, it says that we also may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Now here they're saying we'd rather have a king going out before us, but it was historically the Lord that went out before them and fought their battles. They wanted Saul to take the Lord's place in striking down the enemy. And then one other reference in 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 24, where you get this idea. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of going in the tops of the mulberry trees, that then thou shalt bestir thyself, for then shall the Lord go out before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And so what an encouragement, really, to Barak. Go on, because the Lord has already gone before. Uh, he's leading the way. He, and isn't he the captain of the, uh, of the armies of the Lord of hosts. Isn't he the one who leads into battle? And so what an encouragement. The Lord's gone before. And he uh, is preparing the way for victory. The Lord hath delivered Sisera. And then notice in verse 15 that her prophetic words were true. We read in verse 15, and the Lord discomforted Sisera in all his chariots. And truly, we would say, salvation belongeth to the Lord. Psalm 3 and verse 8, right? Salvation belongs to the Lord. And 
if you look at chapter 5, we'll see exactly what happened. Chapter 5, verse 21, it says, The river of Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river of Kishon, O oh my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. And so how did the Lord discomfort Sisera? Well, his confidence was in his technology. He's got these tremendous chariots of iron, 900 of them. And so, and, and the battlefield's looking good. Uh, it's nice and hard, nice and dry, perfect for maneuvering his chariots. And so he's, he is very self-confident. We're going to win this. But the Lord, in the very dry season, sent a flash flood, and the river flooded and swept them away. And in a very real sense, uh, their chariots became useless because they were literally stuck in the mire. And the Canaanite god that they remember, Baal, was the god of storms. And so even this sudden change of the weather would affect this superstitious people, making them wonder, is God against them? You know, that, that he's, he's, he's taken away their, their God, it seems to have taken away their, their advantage. But we're seeing it from the true perspective, and it's the Lord who discomforted Sisera and all his chariots and all his horse with the edge of the sword before Barak, so that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his feet. Now, again, I want to just remind us in the previous verse, that phrase, so Barak went down from Mount Tabor and 10,000 men after him. And this is why Barak is in Hebrews 11, because he, he has to act in faith. All he's got to go on is the prophetic word that is given through Deborah that says the Lord's gone into the battle before you. But as far as he can, he's concerned, he's going down the mountain against overwhelming odds, 900 chariots of iron, uh, weaponry that they do not have. They, they hardly, as we'll see when we get to chapter five, they hardly have a sword between them. So they, they don't have the weapons, but what they have is the promise that God is going to fight for them. He's gone before to fight for them. And Barak believes the promise and he leaves his comfort zone and he goes down the mountain into overwhelming odds but going in faith, believing the words that were spoken to him through God's prophetess, <clears throat> um, Deborah. So just think about it. Concerning these Israelites, there's not a chariot among them, scarcely a weapon of war, but there's a prophetess among them the appointed representative of him who has chosen the weak and foolish things of this world to confound the things that are mighty. And at their head is a man of faith, believing this promise. And they, they're undismayed by the 900 chariots of iron, knowing that with God, all things are possible. And they go right into battle and see the Lord do a marvelous, a win, a marvelous victory for them. Through this violent rainstorm, rainstorm, the river bursting its banks, flooding the area and making the chariots of iron useless. And so it says in verse 16, but Barak pursued after the chariots and after the host and to Harasheth of the Gentiles and all the hosts of Sisera fell upon the edge of the sword and there was not a man left. And so it's a complete and utter rout, a slaughter. They, they slaughter uh, these uh, Gentile uh, host, these forces. And yet it says, how be it, verse 17, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite, for there was peace between Jabin, the king of Hazor, and the house of Heber the Kenite. Again, the man who should have been loyal to Israel had made peace with the enemy, and so there's this treaty between them, and even he's been tipping them off and all the rest of it. And so Sisera makes his move there. And again, wisdom of the world would say, Sisera made a really wise move here. 
Uh, he, he went into the tent of a woman. Who would ever think of looking for him there? I mean, this seems to be really wise, and you could tell uh, how uh, confident he is in his worldly wisdom that, that when he goes there, he falls into a deep sleep, showing how secure he felt in this hiding place. And so it tells us um, that uh, verse uh, 18, it says, Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, turn in, my Lord, turn in to me, fear not. And when he had turned in unto her, unto the tent, she covered him with a mantle. And he said unto her, give me, I pray thee, a little water to drink, for I'm thirsty. And she opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. So we got all this kind of little descriptions of, of the details. Of course, uh, he's he's come uh, out of battle, uh, he's of course that, that's exhausting in itself. Uh, he's been fleeing on foot, and no doubt not not delaying or dallying. He's been running. Uh, it, there's been a rainstorm. He's wet, uh, you know, kind of with all that. And so he goes in there. He's he's chilled. He's exhausted. Uh, she covers him over with with a with a mantle with a with a blanket. And she gives him a bottle of milk. Now, it's kind of interesting now, of course, uh, no refrigeration in the tent. I doubt they had solar panels and all the rest of it. And so, uh, you know, he's not going to the fridge and getting the old. Do you remember the old fashioned bottles of milk before they went cardboard? And and you even have the plastic bag ones that are so weird, you know, but the old bottles, you remember those? Well, that's not what it was. It basically would have been like the leather bag. And it would most likely have been some kind of fermented yogurt drink, something like that, because there's no way of refrigerating it. But basically, that's what they gave. She gave him to drink. Kind of interesting. My father, um, when he was alive, used to always have a glass of milk before he went to bed. And he was he was sure that it helped him sleep. Now, I'm not a milk person, so I've never followed my dad in that habit. But that's that was what he would do. And maybe there's some truth in that. But whatever, uh, it certainly sent this this man probably is a mixture of his exhaustion, uh, the security he felt because he was he felt he's hiding in a safe place, uh, perhaps. Uh, as a friend of mine used to always preach on this, he would talk about. He, he gave her a, a bowl of ice cream. She gave him a bowl of ice cream, and, and then basically uh, he fell into a deep sleep. And he felt totally, totally secure. And again, worldly wisdom he would say, yeah, he's pretty secure in that place. But here's the amazing thing. Remember the word of prophecy that Deborah had given. You're going to win the victory, but the honor is going to go to a woman. And this is all God's plan, you see. This is the woman that's in view here. This is the woman. See, he feels secure, but he's ignorant of the fact that a prophecy has been given that was about to be fulfilled in the tent of jail that very day when the Lord sold him into the hands of a woman. And so, <clears throat> Jael, her name means wild goat. And I suppose you can see she's, she's quite a hardy character. <laughs> that's for sure. But that's what it means, a wild goat. And uh, it has the idea of ascending. You know how goats kind of go up the mountain. So it has the idea of ascending. And uh, if Deborah, we've said, was a prophetess, Jael was a pilgrim living in tents in separation uh, from her, her own people. But unlike a husband, she was not to prepared to lower her standards by forging a friendship with Jabin. She had a sight on a path of ascent that would lead her to reestablishing links with the children of Israel. And so what does she do? It tells us in verse um, 20, first of all, that he appeals to her. He said to her, stand in the door, the tent shall be that if any man doth come and inquire of thee, say, is there a man here that thou shalt say no? And then it says, then Jael Heber's wife took a nail of the tent and took an hammer in her hand and went softly unto him and smote the nail of his temples and fastened it into the ground for he was fast asleep and weary. So he died. And so what we see here is this. In chapter 3, we saw Ehud 
thrusting the sword of the word into Eglon. Remember this two-edged sword with his left hand. And of course, it's a symbol of the word of God, right? It's the word of God is, is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. And it was the word of God that defeated the flesh. And here we got a hammer being driven, <laughs> as it were, and a nail driven into the head of this man. I want you to go with me, please, to the book of Jeremiah just for a moment in chapter 23. Jeremiah and chapter 23 and verse 29. God says to Jeremiah, his prophet, is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. So not only is God's word like a two-edged sword, it's also like a fire, and it's also like a hammer breaking in pieces the rock. And so what's the picture here? Notice where she drives the nail in with the hammer in the temples. Remember, Jabin has the idea of intellect, and we said this is all kind of the worldly satanic wisdom, that wisdom that is really uh, from beneath, you know, that's sensual, devilish. And how do we deal with that wisdom of the world? How do we, how do we cope with all that? Well, what we do is we drive in the hammer of the word of God into the mind, and when we drive that, that word of God into the mind of the people of God, it drives out the worldly wisdom that is captivating the minds. The Lord says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. And again, how is God? God's word does that, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, prior to our salvation, many of us, uh, you know, I was a, a, a barroom philosopher standing at a bar philosophizing about all the events in the world. And, you know, and it was all worldly wisdom. It was just nonsense. And it was when the word of God came that it drove out the folly of worldly wisdom and it hammered in the truth of God. Oh, what a difference, you see. And that's, that's, the, that's where the victory comes from. And we have to make sure, because you see, the, the subtlety is, the danger is, that the people of God, because of their addiction to media, in whatever form it is, whether it's television, whether it's internet or whatever, we've got to remind ourselves that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. And, and he's the chief minister of propaganda, and he is putting out his lies constantly. And so the only way we can be safe is if we take the hammer, as it were, of the word of God, and we put that into the temples, into our minds. And that is the only way that we'll get victory over the, the folly and the destructive nature of worldly wisdom. Of course, in the Eastern culture, it was the woman who put up and took down the tents. So jail sure knew how to use a hammer. And as we have seen, the tent peg speaks uh, of her pilgrim character and the hammer of the word of God. And again, that word of God, when it's driven home, can silence and defeat the wisdom that is of this world. Of course, for the commander of the army to die when fleeing from battle would have been greatly shameful. But to be slain by a woman, oh, that was total humiliation. And again, how God has a way of humbling the prideful wisdom of this world. And so it says, verse 22, behold, as Barak pursued Caesar, a jail came out to meet him, said to him, come, I will show thee the man whom thou seekest. And when he came into her tent, 
Behold, Sisera lay dead, and the nail was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. Now, now notice it's Sisera, his captain of his host, who is dead, but Jabin, whose name means intelligence, is subdued that day. And it says, And the hand of the children of Israel prospered and prevailed against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. And so what a, a wonderful victory is brought before us here. And so that leads us on to chapter five. And chapter five is a marvelous chapter. Uh, I have just so enjoyed studying chapter five. Enjoyed, maybe it's not the word. I've been very challenged by it. And it's a retrospect chapter. It's describing in detail what took place in chapter four. The, chapter four was all written in prose. Chapter five is the same events, but written in poetry. Okay. And it's uh, again, just, uh, uh, it, it's, it's not, um, it is, it is not, uh, how will we put it? Um, it's not Deborah, the prophetess in chapter five. It's Deborah, the poetess in chapter five. She's writing uh, her uh, recounting of the incident, but it's really a hymn. And of course, as we know that, that hymns are quite poetic, uh, aren't they, in their, in their very nature. And uh, uh, of course, um, many of the hymns were written that we sing were originally written as poems and then put to music. And so this is really, we, we're going to call this the Song of Deborah and Barak. Now, Song of Deborah, because she wrote it, but it would seem that Barak sang it with her. And so notice verse one, it says, Then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying. And so it's a song. Now, it's kind of, there's a lot of similarities between chapter four and chapter five. Obviously, they're telling the same story. Both of them begin and end with the role of women in the victory of Israel. Right? So in chapter four, uh, we, we began with, with Deborah being the prophetess, basically. And then chapter four ended with Jael. And here in this song, we're going to see the same thing. It begins with then sang Deborah. She's written first. She's, it's her song. And we, we, we're going to see it's her song because of the personal pronouns that are written throughout here. For instance, in verse 3, notice, Hear, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Uh, you see again, verse 7, The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until that I, Deborah, rose, that I arose a mother in Israel. Verse 9, my heart is toward the governors of Israel. Uh, verse uh, 13, then he made him that remaineth have dominion over the nobles among the people. The Lord made me have dominion over the mighty. And then verse 21, it says, the river of Kishon swept them away, that ancient river, the king, the river of Kishon. Oh, my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. And so quite clearly, uh, this is uh, the... Uh, this woman writing this wonderful piece of poetry that is set to music and that is sung by her and Barak in a duet. Now, it's kind of interesting, too. Let me just say this, that um, if you look through our hymn book and you pay attention to the authors, you'll be surprised at how many of the beautiful hymns we sing, especially at the remembrance meeting, were written by godly women. Now, we're not just thinking Fanny, G Fanny Crosby or uh, Francis Ridley Havergal, although they're the most well-known, but Mary Bowley Peters, Hannah K. Burlingham, we could just go on and on. Uh, and so I always thank God for that poetic expression of devotion to the Lord. It's wonderful, isn't it? And certainly we see it here in uh, Deborah's song. Now, um, a great battle had taken place, and this is really very applicable, this chapter, because, because we're in the middle of a battle. And this is kind of the evaluation at the end of the battle. 
It really is. It's, it's evaluate, well, who was involved in the battle? Who could have been involved but wasn't involved? What happened to them? And it's almost like a little viewpoint of what I would say is the judgment seat of Christ. When the battle is over, the story will be told, and there'll be an assessment what we did in the battle. How did we, how did we take part in the wars of the Lord? You see, so it's, so it's very sobering and very applicable because we're in the midst of a battle today. We're in the battle for truth. We're in the battle for the souls of men. We're in the midst of a raging battle. And we need a sense of urgency and to adopt a warfare mentality. And this is all relevant because I'm sure if we're paying any attention to the media right now, we realize uh, war is on our minds, right? What's going on in Ukraine and all the rest of it. And what we do know is that war means sacrifice, not just for the people who are on the front lines, but for the people on the home front as well. I often, of course, World War II history fascinates me. And of course, um, growing up in England, uh, I think of what it meant for people on the home front. Yeah, it meant frugal living. There was rationing. They, they couldn't indulge themselves because there was a war effort going on. And so they had to live frugally so that the battle could be won against the, the forces of darkness. Uh, so there was, there was frugal living. There was rationing. There, was, there were people volunteering for all kinds of activities. There was a volunteer land army that were, uh, were digging for Britain, so to speak. There was all kinds of things. There's hardship. Uh, people worked long hours. People experienced hardship. There was, there was sacrifice. Uh, there was urgency. Uh, boosting morale uh, on every occasion. There, there was uh, obedience to orders. It, I mean, it was amazing. And somehow we forget that we're in a war and that we need to adopt a war mentality. People lived like a war was going on. And we see that today in Ukraine. People are committed to defending their, their heritage from a, a foreign oppressor. And, and their motive is love of country and love of freedom. Well, for us, we should also be involved for the same reasons. We love the, the real country that we belong to, the heavenly country. We're ambassadors for Christ. And, and that the interests of that heavenly country are under attack right now from the evil one. And so we need to take this mindset. Now, notice, too, um, it's the only song found in the book of Judges. There was a song that all sang in Exodus 15. Remember after that great deliverance uh, over Pharaoh? But it was a song of redemption. And it was a song that everybody could sing. Okay, And everybody was expected to sing. But this song in Judges 5 is not a song of redemption. It's already a redeemed people. But this is the song of the overcomers, right? It's the ones that have seen the Lord do wonders for them in giving them victory over the enemy, redeem people, but experiencing victory in battle. And in this instance, there's only two people singing it. <laughs> Deborah and Barak. It's the song of the overcomers. Two witnesses singing of God's deliverance in a day of ruin. That's what we find in Judges chapter 5. So they're praising God in a, in a different way. As we said, Moses is a song of redemption. This song is the great actings of God in bringing deliverance to an already redeemed people who have been brought back into bondage. And these are people that have experienced victory and have overcome the enemy. It's a song of overcomers. A song sang in difficult times celebrates how God comes in for his people in a day of ruin that cry out to him for deliverance. I want to give a, a kind of an outline of chapter five. And uh, verses one through five is their delight in God. Of course, he's the one that 
as we saw in the previous chapter, that gave them the victory. The Lord hath delivered Sisera into thy hand, verse 14. The Lord hath discomfited Sisera. And so verses 1 through 5 is really praising God. It's their delight in God as he displayed his glory in delivering them. So just a simple title, Delight in God. Verses 6 through 11 describes the distress in Israel prior to this victory. What was it like living in Israel when they were under the bondage of Jabin and Sisera and the Canaanites? What was everyday life like? We get a description of that. So you get distress in Israel. Verses 12 through 18 deals with divided loyalties. And that really is um, the response of God's people to the battle call of Deborah and Barak. And what we're going to see is there was a, a mixed response. Some got involved. They, they jeoparded their lives to fight in the wars of the Lord. In others, well, they couldn't be bothered. They stayed on the beach. <laughs> they stayed where they were. They, they just weren't stirred. And so there's, there's divided loyalties. Some are loyal to their nation, loyal to the cause of the Lord, and others are just living for themselves, and they're, they're indifferent. They can't be, they can't be bothered. <clears throat> Verses 19 through 23 describes the defeat of the Canaanites, God's victory described in detail. And verse 24 through 31 is the death of Sisera and the despondency of his mother. So again, we end up with a couple of women in that final verse. But just to remind us <clears throat> that every Christian will be reviewed after the battle is over. Scripture says we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We have an appointment with the Lord Jesus and that day will reveal what we have done in the day of battle, whether it was good or whether it was worthless. You see, the cross not only brings redemption, but it brings responsibility. And there's going to be an assessment. <clears throat> so chapter 5 will reveal that there was real involvement on the part of a few and there was little involvement or absolute apathy on the part of many. And it's very challenging for us to ask the question, how committed am I to this battle? How involved am I in this battle? Am I content with my commitment in the face of an evil enemy who right now is coming in like a flood? Am I up for the fight? So it says, then sang Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, on that day, saying. And so it's a, it's a song on that day, the day that the Lord delivered them. It's, it's responding to his great deliverance. And again, how we should be relishing singing songs of deliverance. Yes, the song of redemption. How we, don't we love to say it? Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. But isn't it nice to, to be able to sing songs of victory as well? Uh, to, to sing victory songs in the sense that we've enjoyed victory over the enemy. Christ liveth in me. Christ liveth in me. Oh, what a salvation this, that Christ liveth in me. And so it's, it's, a, it's a victory song. And so they're singing together. And, of course, they're calling people to praise the Lord who's given the victory. Verse 2, praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel when the people willingly offered themselves. Now, several things to point out here. First of all, the Derby translation and the revised version have a very different rendering in verse 2, instead of uh, saying, praise ye the Lord for the avenging of Israel, they have basically the idea, praise thee the Lord for the, for, for the leaders led in Israel and the people willingly offered themselves, bless ye Jehovah. That's how Darby puts it, for the leaders led in Israel, for the, the people willingly offered themselves, bless ye Jehovah. And it is a wonderful thing when leaders lead and people follow. And we need people today who will, like Paul of old, be able to say this, follow me as I follow Christ. 
and call men to the battle, men and women to, to as it were, take up the, the, the gospel uh, cause and, and go out and fight the enemy. And, of course, notice that people volunteered. It says people willingly offered themselves. Of course, we've witnessed some of that, haven't we, in what's going on in Ukraine. Volunteers. I, I saw the other day there are 60 UK veterans that have volunteered to go and fight for Ukraine. Yeah, they're, they've fought in previous conflicts and they packed up their bags and off they've gone. And there are, there are people there in Ukraine going and volunteering. And it's, it's interesting that in every conflict, volunteers are always welcome. And yet, sometimes we hide behind a call. Well, I can't volunteer because I haven't been called. <laughs> and sometimes it's just a cop-out. I'm sorry, it's just a cop-out. We have a commission. It says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <laughs> we have uh, the ultimate authority who has given us this command to go. And what we need is to willingly offer ourselves for the battle. <coughs> Excuse me. So people were willing to volunteer in a time of need. And it was a time of need. And now, today, it's a time of need. And so what a wonderful thing. Something to praise God about when leaders led and when people willingly offered themselves. And again, we, we have that opportunity I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies a living sacrifice. Uh, we have an opportunity to, to fight in the wars of the Lord, to present ourselves and to say, here I am, Lord. And, and again, thankful, you, you're committed to weak and foolish things. So as far as qualifications concerned, I have all the weakness and all the foolishness. Uh, so I qualify absolutely 100%. <laughs> so here I am, Lord, take me up and use me. Notice, she says, Here, O ye kings, give ear, O ye princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord, the God of Israel. And so she, she's just praising the Lord for what he has done. And again, when you're involved in conflict and you see victories, it gives you tremendous cause to praise the Lord. Right? Nothing more thrilling to see the Lord come through and, and fight the battles for you and to be able to praise him for it. And there's, that's where she's at. She's, she's just thrilled with the greatness of God. And we need to be convinced of the greatness of God as we go into battle. It's, it's our confidence is in him, his ability, his power, his power to deliver. And so we need to be convinced of that. Now, it's interesting in verse four and five, he said, she says, Lord, when thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marchest out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. The clouds also dropped water. The mountains melted from before the Lord, even that Sinai from before the Lord God of Israel. And what she's doing is she's actually referring back to the book of Deuteronomy in chapters 30, chapter 33 in verses one through three. I want us to just look back there to see what she has in mind as she makes these, uh, these wonderful statements about God. And you'll see the parallels in chapter 33, verses 1 through 3. And this is the blessing wherewith Moses, the man of God, blessed the children of Israel before his death. And he said, the Lord came from Sinai and rose up from Seir unto them. He shined forth from Mount Paran. He came with 10,000s of saints. From his right hand went a fiery law for them. Yea, he loved the people. All his saints are in thy hand. And they sat down at, at thy feet. Everyone shall receive of thy words. And notice just the idea of the Lord from Sinai, from Seir, all of these things, the same language 
is the language she uses in verse 4 and 5. Thou wentest out of Seir, when thou marched out of the field of Eden, the earth trembled, the heavens dropped, so on and so forth. And so basically, uh, what she's saying is simply this. It's also quoted, by the way, in Psalm 68, verses 7 and 8. But what she's saying is, it's the God of Sinai who responded to Israel's cry for deliverance. The same God that came down on the mountain at Sinai, this powerful God so that the earth trembled, that same God is the one that came at Israel's cry for deliverance and defeated Sisera. The amazing thing is that God doesn't change, doesn't he? does he not? I am the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same gods whose power was seen so clearly at Sinai was also seen that day on the field of battle as he took the field to fight against the enemies of his people. And that's her boast. She is boasting in the greatness of her God. Now, just we'll just look at verse 6, and then our time is almost done. But I want you to notice something about verse 6. It says, In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through byways. So it's given us a description of the distress in the nation of Israel. Several observations. First of all, Shamgar seems to be uh, a contemporary of Jael. They seem to have lived at the same time. They also had something else in common. Neither one of them were Israelites. And both of them ended up being heroes in the nation, or hero and a heroine in the nation, at a very difficult time. Remember Shamgar and his ox gourd and 600 Philistines, and now Jael and her tent peg and her hammer is also going to be a heroine for the nation of Israel. And why it was necessary for these people to stand up was because of the conditions that prevailed. And what were these conditions? Well, it was this, this land of promise that God had given to his people the people were so scared of the intimidating tactics of the enemy that they didn't walk on the highways. It just wasn't safe to go out on the highways. They had to go alternative routes because the enemy, with his 900 chariots, had got all the highways covered, you see. So you just you didn't go out on the regular roads. And so this, this was the distress that the nation found themselves in. And there were people that weren't content to live in such bondage. And the amazing thing is, the ones that are mentioned weren't even Israelites, Shamgar and Jael. But they just couldn't bear it. And they stood up and they were counted. And so we would say, we're living in difficult days. And days when it's time for God's people to stand up and be counted. In the light of the coming day when we will give an account <laughs> of what we've done in the day of battle, it's time to stand up. It's time to believe God and his promises, to go out into the battle with our confidence in him, fighting for us. But he wants us to take part in the conflict of the ages. It's time to get involved. May God encourage us and help us as we consider these things. Amen.